Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you're having a good time here. I know this can be a hard time of the day. Uh, I'm the only thing between you and lunch, and uh, there's been two days of talks. Uh, last night was fun. We had an amazing time at Ruby Karaoke. Uh, so I'll try to make this entertaining for you. Um, so this is actually my first time at RubyConf. Uh, it's also my first time in New Orleans. Uh, and I have really enjoyed my time here, but as Aaron, I think, just pointed out, so far the conference team, team seems to have been about death. Uh, <laughs> that's a bit sad. Uh, I really don't think Ruby's dead, but just so we are all clear, let's check the internet, because that's where you check when you want to find the source of truth for something. So let's see it. Okay. Yeah, Ruby's not dead yet. Thanks for building the website, Jason. <laughs> yeah, we're safe. Woo! Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, uh, we can continue. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I work at a company called Cookpad. I like it when people tweet at me during my talks, so that's my Twitter handle. And I came all the way from Colombia. And uh, if Narcos is everything you know about Colombia, <laughs> I think you should definitely go and visit. Uh, and uh, have, like, know the real Colombia. And I, in fact, like, I have the perfect excuse for you to go there. We have a Ruby conference there. Uh, next one's going to be uh, September 2018. Uh, we'll be announcing the exact date really soon. So uh, you can follow the conference on Twitter. Uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, so lately, I've been like trying to get into stuff different from programming. So I've been taking some like, cooking lessons uh, to improve my culinary skills. So when I, when I was accepted to give the talk here, I decided that I wanted to prepare some jambalaya because it's something I've always wanted to try. Uh, so I went online, looked for a good recipe. Well, does it, okay, it looks weird there. Uh, <laughs> it looked nice, so I went ahead and bought all the ingredients, prepared everything, followed all the steps, and there was the final result. <laughs> As you can see, it was an epic fail. I definitely have a long way to go. Uh, but before we continue, uh, I, I really want to ask everyone a favor. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, so I would really love to take a selfie with you. Uh, so if you could all like raise your arms, make some noise. I'll do this real quick, I promise. <laughs> Woo, yeah, thanks. <laughs> You're great. Awesome. So now let's get a bit more serious. Uh, the name of the talk is The Overnight Failure, and this talk is based on a true story, <laughs> something that happened to me on a previous job I had. So why do I want to talk about this? Uh, why, do I want, why do I want to talk to tell everyone about a time I really fucked up? Uh, well, there are a few reasons, and I'll share the, like, the most important with you. So first of all, we all have broken the internet at some point. We all have screwed up really bad. We all have created bugs that made it into production at some point. And if it hasn't happened to you yet, it will happen, believe me. It's just a matter of time. Uh, and also, because we don't normally talk about this in public, like uh, at conferences or like meetups or whatever, we see people talking about what they learned, how they built a cool thing, how they made a project be successful. Uh, this basically, we just mo we mostly hear about success stories. And I think. People should really talk more, more about this in public because, uh, I mean, it, it will make talking about screw-ups easier for everyone. Uh, and we normally just talk about this with people that are really close to us. We do it in private, uh, to our families, friends, or maybe our colleagues because, like, they're on the same boat with us. Um, and also because, like, by not speaking about our failures in public, I think we boost imposter syndrome, which is, uh, like, something something terrible that a lot of us have, uh, like, suffer. And uh, although sometimes companies talk about this publicly, for example, like in January, uh, GitHub, sorry, GitLab, <laughs> uh, was down for several hours, uh, or uh, the mistake they take a, a WS and a big chunk of the internet with it down for uh, also a few hours, uh, 
I, and like I can imagine how stressful the situation was. I even remember how like their uh, status website showed that everything was right because like the red icon that issue had been shown was also down because of S3. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something that's easy to laugh about. It's it's fun <laughs> when we look when we like look at other people's experience. But uh, I like if you really think about it, you can probably feel how stressful that situation was for like the people having to deal with it. Uh, and how hard it was like to uh, like keep customers trust and regain it. Uh, so although we, all, we don't all work at companies that, has, that have such a big scale as GitLab or Amazon, uh, we, if we create bugs, they will affect the lives of our users. So it doesn't matter if it's, if we have millions or thousands of hundreds of users, it will always be stressful. Um, so that's why, uh, like, basically the most important, like, I mean, that takes me to the most important reason why I wanted to give this talk and talk about my, my fuck-ups. <laughs> and it's because uh, we learn more from failure than from success. Uh, so when we fail, when we, like, when everything goes wrong or something that we didn't expect to go wrong goes wrong, it's where we learn, we learn the most. So I also want to share a little bit about, about why I, what I learned. So before we move on and I tell you my story, I want you to take a few seconds to maybe close your eyes if you want and think what's the worst thing that could happen to you at work. Imagine what, what could be like the apocalypse for you. <laughs> uh, so, okay, keep that in mind and I'll tell you what my overnight failure story was. So, how, how did it happen? How the overnight failure became a thing? So, I used to work at a company that had a like, product that allowed people to carpool. Has, it, it was a mobile app. And so the mobile app uh, allowed people that use their car to go to work every day. Uh, so for example, let's say this is Mary. So Mary had a car, she used it to go to work, and back every day, uh, and then the app I, I helped build uh, allowed, allowed Mary to f find Anna who had a similar, who didn't have a car and also had a similar commute. So they had like a similar route and the app allowed them to exchange money with one another. Uh, so when they like share the car to go to work, the app keep a record of the trips they took together and even allowed them to be matched with someone else, like for example, John, who also had a similar commute. And so they could ride share or share their car every day to go to work and the app would keep track of every trip they took. So, uh, so how the ex money exchange part worked is that like once a week, there was a process that run that basically charged the passengers and then uh, got the money and paid the driver, paid whoever drove. So for example, in this case, Anna. Uh, so going a little bit deeper, explain how, how this worked technically, uh, how it was implemented. So the process that run once a week looked kind of like this. So every week, uh, uh, like a job was triggered and the job went to the database and checked like every trip that was, uh, that every trip that users took during the previous week. And then for each uh, driver passenger combination, it put like a job on a queue. We could call it like that. So then it created a lot of jobs for each week. And each one of these jobs contained, uh, like as I mentioned, a passenger driver combination and the total for the trips that the passenger should pay the driver. Uh, so after that, what happened is that uh, each job was processed and the passenger was charged using a payment gateway and then the driver was paid. And what's there on the circle was basically managed by the payment gateway. It wasn't managed by our system. The payment gateway took care of all of that. So I don't know if you're still with me. Uh, so let's do a quick recap. So basically, uh, we had an, an app that users used to call pro, carpool every day that uh, took care of the payment process each week. Uh, passengers were charged and drivers were paid. 
for your threads. So now that you kind of understand how it worked, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. Uh, so it was uh, any given Sunday. It was 6 a.m. where the process was triggered, when the process was triggered. And uh, it started as usual. Uh, the process run started, like, yeah, the process run started the, I mean, marked, marked the start of the day that I like to call Black Saturday. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with, uh, like, big discounts and stuff, <laughs> like a shopping spree, a really fun day. It has to do with a re really, really stressful day. So I'll tell you what happened next. So then, let's say you have a user that went really early to the store to buy like some eggs and uh, bread for her breakfast, for her family. And then when she tried to pay, her card was declined. She, and she was like, well, this is weird. Like, well, this shouldn't happen. And this happened like around 6.25 a.m. So she went online, investigated what was going on with her credit card, and she saw a lot of charges that were made by the carpooling company I used to work for uh, on that same morning. So that's, that's the second step of our like, Black Saturday. <laughs> uh, so that was bad, but then things started to look even worse because like, more users were affected by this. And it was not just a few users, it was a bunch of users. <laughs> Uh, so the customer care team started to get like a huge influx of complaints. It was bad. So let's say that at, like at 6:35, a lot of users in like a small amount of time reported like a lot of bugs. So that's I mean a lot of problems, a lot of charges. So that's where things definitely started to look bad. And so it was 6:34. I was sleeping. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but I, I'm always sleeping on Saturday at that time. <laughs> Uh, so I was happily sleeping in my bed, and then the phone rang. <laughs> and it was a call from my boss. And this is roughly how the conversation went. My boss told me, like, hey, sorry to wake you up this early, but there's, like, a, uh, an issue in production. Uh, there's a lot of customers complaining about it. And I was like, uh, okay, sure, like, uh, I'll take a look right away. I was really stressed. I was trying to act cool. So I thought we had uh, ended the call, and I was like, fuck! <laughs> fuck! And then my boss said, like, hey, I'm still on the line. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't looking promising. <laughs> so then, OK, this is how our day, like Black, Black Saturday was looking like. So it was not even 7 a.m. The day was already crappy. So I started to look into what was going on, and I checked the payment gateway, and I definitely saw a lot of duplicated, charge, uh, duplicated charges. So the first thing I noticed uh, was that they, this, like, I mean, this didn't make any sense. So when I looked at our system, uh, like our billing system, I saw that the, you, the, sorry, the queue was still full of jobs. And so the first thing I thought I was doing was like to kill that, that part of the process. So basically, uh, stop processing jobs. And that will as, as, at least still not create more charges. And, but then I looked at the queue again, and the queue grow, grew. <laughs> this was bad. <laughs> uh, so then I decided to basically like, stop the whole process to, so that no more jobs were put into the queue. And then like the first thing I thought about was like, okay, let's refu refund all the charges that we shouldn't have made. And this, this sounded like a really good idea at the moment, but you'll see that later maybe it wasn't. Uh, so then another thing I noticed is that like a lot of the charges we had already made uh, created like a lot of transfers to the drivers and there were, those were still also happening. So I also had to go and repair, reverse all those transfers and stop the ones that were remaining. So we could say that at like 7.28, the problem was kind of contained uh, at this point. Uh, so yeah, the day wasn't still, was still not looking very good. Uh, the queue was full. It was full of jobs, had thousands of jobs to be processed. And when I started looking at them, I started look, uh, like noticing a pattern. 
So there were a lot of duplicated jobs, as you might have expected. Uh, a lot of them contained the same user that was a passenger, the same user that was a driver, and the same amount to be charged. Uh, so yeah, there were a lot of duplicated ones. So what I noticed is that like something, I mean, for, to me it was clear that the problem was in two points of the system. The, the problem was that here on this part of the system, uh, it seems like we were putting every passenger driver pair on the queue thousands of times for some reason. And also that for some reason, when we processed the jobs, we didn't check if we had already charged that passenger driver combination. We still charge it, charge them no matter what. Uh, so after look debugging, finding what was going on, finding like what was the best to, to solve this, I wrote some tests that failed and like uh, wrote the code to make them pass, deployed it, and it was all kind of fixed, or fixed, <laughs> and, but that took a long time. Uh, I, it was a long day. I felt really dumb, really frustrated, and when I was about to, to, to deploy the, like, the code I wrote, uh, I did the programmer's prayer that Aaron <laughs> taught to us on <laughs> RailsConf this year. So please work, please work, please work. <laughs> uh, fortunately, it did. Uh, so uh, at 2, uh, sorry, at 10.55 p.m., I started doing the obvious thing. Started looking for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was not true, but it was really frustrating. This is how I felt. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. OK, so this is what, what had happened. So there were thousands of users affected by the bug. All users were charged a different amount. Uh, the worst case being one that was charged over $5,000. <laughs> and when we should have only charged a user 50. Uh, some users were charged up to 500 times. <laughs> uh, and uh, the worst part was that like we maxed out a lot of credit cards and also emptied a lot of savings accounts. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, I did like I created a refund for every extra charge we did, and the problem was that like charges take a, uh, sorry refunds take a long time, <laughs> and people didn't have any money on their banks account on their banks account, so I'll tell you uh, in a few minutes how we dealt with that. Uh, the the good I mean something I was really glad about that is that we were still not on Ruby tree, <laughs> because if so many jobs were processed in such a little amount of time. I couldn't imagine what would happen if we were using that. <laughs> the problem have, would have been much, much terrible. So as I was mentioning, refunds take up to five business days. So there was unacceptable for a lot of our users. So what we had to do is like reach out to all of them and offer them like an expedited way to, uh, to reimburse them, like an expedited option. Some of them were like just sending them checks or like, I don't know, be a PayPal. We did whatever we could and, and then figure out what to do with the refund. Uh, but this was really stressful. I spent like, I remember that at least the next week just grabbing information about how, how bad we have fuck up, fucked up. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was really bad. Um, so why did I, I mean, why do I, why did I want to tell you all of this? Uh, like, why is this important? I want to go back to the why. So, embarrassing, embarrassing things will happen. Uh, it will eventually happen to all of us, as I mentioned before. And you might think that tests will, might save you from this, but they won't. We had tests. <laughs> uh, that code review might save you from this, but it won't. We had code review that maybe having a QA team will save you from this, but it won't. We <laughs> had that as well. <laughs> uh, software is built by humans. And as Olivier uh, mentioned on his talk, I think on Wednesday, uh, we're all humans, we make mistakes, so 
bad things will happen eventually. And we need to make, uh, make admitting mistakes easy for everyone. It's really important to create a culture where admitting mistakes is fine and you don't feel like you have to blame others or to make excuses up for a mistake you made. And we need to be trust that we won't be judged. Um, because the, like, I mean, the, the safer people feel about admitting their mistakes, the more they will learn about them and the more their colleagues will learn about them, the more we as a community will learn about it. So when you're dealing with this sort of situation, like my first recommendation is that you make sure before doing anything that you understand, you really understand what happened. It's really easy to jump to quick conclusions and do uh, like whatever you think is the easiest fix or the most quick fix for something. And sometimes we end up making the problem worse. Uh, as it happened with the refunds, uh, it was a pain, a, a, a headache basically to deal with the people uh, that we sent money in like a different type of form and then we had already uh, like done a refund for, it was crazy. It was a lot of, we had to go into a, like a lot of trouble and talk to the payment gateway a lot. By the way, like I don't know how the payment gateway allowed us to do this. <laughs> like days you have noticed that we were doing something weird. But anyway, <laughs> uh, my second recommendation would be move really slow. <laughs> so don't rush. Uh, the problem, I mean, there's, you really already screw up. The problem's already, uh, people already notice the problem. So it doesn't mean that the quicker you fix it, uh, I mean, that if you fix it quick, they, like some people will notice. That's not the case. Uh, so just make sure that you take the time to think what you're really doing, which really uh, goes back to the thing I just mentioned, the first point I just mentioned. Something that I really also learned and uh, that I think a lot of companies ha do a very, very good job doing this is document the problem, document what happened, document what the root cause of it was, uh, document how you fixed it, document what you will do to prevent this from happening again. Uh, so also document the fix. And document, this is the most important thing I think, document the lesson learned. Uh, because that's the only way that you will really prevent stuff from happening again. And also, don't do this, don't get blame. <laughs> it's not about who wrote the code where the bug was. That's not important. The important thing is that the process failed, the company failed, the team failed. It's, it's, not, the, it's not only the fault of the person who wrote the code, that's just part of it. Uh, so doing get blame is just like not creating a good cult culture where people will, be, will feel safe and, try and will feel like trust to admit their mistakes. And really importantly, you are not your failures. Uh, don't think that because you failed, you did a big screw up, uh, you're the worst developer ever, because you're not. Everyone has done it. Every, every developer you have admired, they have screwed up at some point, believe me. And I think Chad Fowler can put it better than me, like no one will care about your, the box you create. Uh, when you die. <laughs> so keep in mind that it's so temporary. So uh, as bad as you might feel at the moment that you're dealing with a really bad situation, it will pass. And you will look at it in the past and laugh about it, give, give talks about it. Uh, we'll, we're here, I mean, I, I really want to celebrate our failures because they also make us what we do. So you can come and talk to me Tell me your failures. I've heard a lot, and it's a lot of fun. It's kind of therapeutic. Uh, and also, you can tweet using the hashtag of the conference. It would be great if we share our war stories, our scars. Um, because as a, as a community, we can help each other and, uh, and like get us through this like really stressful moments uh, in our careers. Uh, we, can, we can make it together. And uh, I'll actually let uh, Jonathan and PJ say it better. <laughs> oh, too bad you can hear that. Uh, so anyway, I think that's all I wanted to say for today. I work for this, oh wait, what happened?
Okay, we're back. Okay, I work for this company called Cookpad. Go and check it out if you like cooking and uh, like or sharing your recipes. We're hiring as everyone else. Uh, so if you want to work at a company that works, uh, let, sorry, that where you can build like an application that's used by millions of people around the world, uh, come talk to me. And thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs>